After we have discussed the possibilities to generate renewable electricity, it is time to look at the other energy carriers that we need for final energy use, fuels and heat. For fuels, we have three major options to utilize them in a climate-friendly way. First of all, bioenergy. Next, hydrogen, provided it is produced in a climate-friendly way. And lastly, keep using fossil fuels, but then combined with carbon capture and storage. Let us now have a closer look on each of these three options. Biofuels already play a substantial role in the global energy system. First of all, biofuels are used for heating. The largest part is so-called traditional use for cooking in rural areas in developing countries. But it is also used for space heating of buildings. In various countries, you also see the use of biofuels in industry. But in these cases, it is mainly industries that already have a strong relation with the forestry sector, for example, the pulp and paper industry. We see that overall the share is already quite substantial at about 10% of global final energy use. But we also see that the total is quite stable, there is not much development. Another important application is the use of biofuels as a replacement for diesel and gasoline in cars and trucks. Here there is quite some growth. Ethanol, which can be mixed into gasoline, is the largest one, but also biodiesel already plays a substantial role. The application has nearly doubled, doubled over the past 10 years, but the share in total final energy use is still very modest, at 1%. The area of bioenergy is very complex, because there are quite a few different sources. There are many conversion processes, and there are also various applications. Let us discuss each of them separately. When we look at the sources of bioenergy, it is good to recognize that we can grow crops to turn into biofuels, but it is also possible to use a variety of residues. We can further distinguish between primary residues, which is waste from the forestry and agriculture sector, like branches and straw, secondary residues from processing industries, for example, the food industry, and the paper industry. And finally, tertiary residues are post-consumer residues like organic household waste or sewage. Of course, next to that we can also grow energy crops, for example rapeseed or sugarcane and many other different types of crops as shown here. Let's now have a look at the various conversion processes. Still, very much the most important way to utilize biomass is via combustion. It can be used to produce heat or electricity. Another important conversion is the production of liquid biofuels. One example is the production of ethanol with the help of fermentation out of sugarcane, maize or other crops. Another technology is the production of biodiesel out of vegetable oils, like rapeseed oil. There are also a number of new processes under development, for example, enzymatic hydrolysis, which can make, make so-called lignocellulosic materials, like wood, suitable for the production of ethanol. Gasification can be used to produce synthetic fuels, and also a very common process is anaerobic digestion, which can be used to turn manure and organic waste into biogas. It should be recognized that bioenergy is no silver bullet. It has many associated issues. In principle, bioenergy is a sustainable energy source with low greenhouse gas emissions. But it is important to consider the emissions throughout supply and conversion processes. It is also important to note the impact of indirect land use changes, whereby due to harvesting bioresources for energy purposes, there may be a shift of crops to other land and that ultimately may lead to deforestation. Another issue is carbon debt, which means that there is a delay between the harvesting and regrowth of the crops 
and this means that CO2 is temporarily in the atmosphere, which contributes to global warming. And finally, in many cases, the use of bioenergy will have an impact on biodiversity. This should, of course, be avoided as much as possible. Although bioenergy can be used as a fuel, it's also good to look at the alternatives. One increasingly recognized option is hydrogen. It already plays a role in the global energy system. The production is currently about 9 exajoules, which is about 2.5% of global final energy use. It is mainly used for ammonia production and in refineries. In most cases it is produced on site and used directly. In virtually all these applications, it is produced with fossil fuels, so it leads to CO2 emissions. The question remains, how can we produce hydrogen with low greenhouse gas emissions? There are basically two approaches, and we indicate them as green hydrogen and blue hydrogen. Green hydrogen is produced out of renewable electricity, for example, solar electricity or wind electricity. This electricity is fed into electrolyzers, which is electrochemical equipment that splits water into hydrogen and oxygen. This hydrogen can then be used as an energy carrier. But we also can produce blue hydrogen. This is the production of hydrogen out of fossil fuels in such a way that the CO2 is not emitted to the atmosphere, but captured and stored underground. This process can be based both on coal and natural gas. The fossil fuel is first converted to carbon monoxide and hydrogen. The carbon monoxide is converted with water to CO2 and ultimately we get a mixture from which the CO2 can be removed and then captured. In this way we have generated hydrogen with low CO2 emissions. Currently this is still a cheaper option than green hydrogen, but the expectation is that the cost of green hydrogen will come down. And finally, as we already said, it is also possible to continue using fossil fuels, but to avoid the associated CO2 emissions. Chemi chemical absorption processes are available that can capture CO2 in a solution. The CO2 can then be extracted. This requires substantial amounts of heat. Next, the CO2 is compressed and it can be stored outside the atmosphere for example, underground. You may ask yourself, how can we store it underground? There are actually quite a few options. First of all, it's possible to store the CO2 in depleted natural gas reservoirs and oil fields. This storage option can even enhance oil recovery in existing wells, of course only as long as we would use fossil oil. Another option is to store store CO2 in so-called aquifers, which are underground water-containing layers. When you inject the CO2, it will push the water aside. Of course, in all cases it is important that the reservoir should be sufficiently tight to prevent emissions escaping back into the atmosphere. Together, these storage options have the capacity to store huge volumes of CO2. Before we finish this video, it is good to remark that we can also produce heat directly. There are a few options. One is geothermal energy. In many countries, there is waters, water at temperatures of say 100 degrees or even more, available at depths of 2 to 4 kilometers underground, and this can be extracted. The heat can be taken out and the cold water will be re-injected underground. It is also possible to use solar energy to produce heat directly for hot water production. It can also be used for space heating, but then you need seasonal storage. Both solar and geothermal energy are generally limited to relatively modest temperatures, say typically 100 degrees and in exceptional cases 200 to 300 degrees. So it can play a useful role for part of the heat that we need. So in summary, we have seen that there are quite some options to produce fuels without CO2 emissions. 
We have bioenergy, we have hydrogen, and we have carbon capture and storage. We can also combine some of these options. For instance, bioenergy coupled with carbon capture and storage could provide negative CO2 emissions. It must be noted, however, that all these options are still relatively expensive, more expensive than their fossil fuel counterparts, at least for the time being. The barriers for upscaling are also still quite substantial. Transitioning to a climate-friendly system is therefore probably one of the biggest challenges of the energy transition.